Microsoft trains a model that's three times as large as GPT-3. Nvidia releases the third iteration of their StyleGAN model. And DeepMind goes hard on ML for biology. Welcome to ML News. You might have already heard this, but Weights and Biases has just raised a Series C round at a valuation of 1 billion US dollars and is now officially a unicorn. Congratulations to Weights and Biases, one of the absolute top products in the market. And I'm not just saying this out of the goodness of my heart, they actually pay me to say this. So thank you so much to Weights and Biases for sponsoring this video. Now, how might this benefit you? Imagine Weights and Biases, they get all of this cash right now, they're just going to dump this on you in form of free product. So you can expect the weights and biases system to become more powerful, better looking, faster, whatever you want. And for the foreseeable future, it's probably going to be available to you for free as it is right now. Hello? Yeah? Yes, yes, that, that's what, yes, that's what I said, yeah. I mean, okay, I can say that. I mean, are you sure? I mean, forever is kind of a long, like, I'm not sure I can make promises against the, the, the nature of the universe. Like, okay, all right, all right. Uh, yes, I'll do it, okay. All right, so apparently the products are gonna be free forever for personal use and academia. Yes, forever. See, that's the beauty of startup money. It's spend first and then earn back later. So if you don't know what Weights and Biases is, Weights and Biases is a general suite of tools for machine learning engineers, machine learning researchers, and everyone in the life cycle of ML products. It can track your experiments, it can save your models and data sets, it can monitor your runs, and it is with you from experiment all the way to deployment. It's usually in the cloud, but it can be on premise. So if you wanna take part in that sweet, sweet cash inflow, go to Weights and Biases right now. And again, congratulations to them. They should absolutely pay me more now that they have more. Hello, hello, and welcome everyone to ML News. There's a lot to go through, so let's get going. Microsoft trains Megatron Turing NLG 530B. Now, how many words can you accumulate to make a model sound really, really, really big? I guess we're gonna find out with the next iteration, but for this iteration, this is a giant model. Now, this is essentially a decoder-only language model, much like GPT-3, yet it is quite a bit bigger. So this model has a 105 layers. Its hidden dimension is over 20,000 and each layer has 128 attention heads. This new model achieves various state-of-the-art results in zero-shot NLP tasks and this blog post details what it can do and more importantly how it was trained. So the training relies on this library called DeepSpeed by Microsoft which is a library to train these large kinds of models split over multiple computers. When I say multiple computers I don't mean 12 Raspberry Pis. In fact, this training is powered by 560 DGX A100 servers. That's not 560 GPUs, that's 560 servers, each of which has eight A100 GPUs inside of them. And everything is connected by NVLink and NVSwitch and super duper infinite band. So this is an absolute beast. It trained with a batch size of 1920 and achieves about 120 teraflops per second per GPU in throughput. Now, the sheer scale of this is absolutely crazy and it's questionable whether or not humanity really wants to go this route of scaling up in this manner. But I'm glad they did in this case. Noteworthy is, for example, the fact that they didn't start out with a big batch size. In fact, they started with a batch size of 32 and then gradually increased to the final batch size. Another noteworthy thing is that their training data is based on the pile by Luther AI, which is an open source data set that came out of the efforts of replicating GPT-3, which noteworthy has not released their training data yet. But like GPT-3, the authors here pay close attention to the quality of their data. So even inside the pile, they sample various proportions differently. And they also add some things from common crawl and real news to arrive at their final data set. The article details 
knows what kind of scores the model reaches on what kind of zero shot tasks. If you're interested, check it out. I don't know if the model will be accessible or whether this was just an academic exercise or whether Microsoft wants to make money with it. I guess we'll see. NVIDIA releases StyleGAN 3. We've covered this paper previously. It was called Alias Free Generative Adversarial Networks. So not much has changed since then. Notably, you can see the comparison of StyleGAN 2, which had a very hard dependency on the position in the image. So you see the hair texture sort of remains at the point where the image is. Yet StyleGAN 3 has solved these issues largely. As you can see, the entire objects move around independent of their absolute position. So this gives rise to a lot more maybe controllable, maybe realistic pictures. So what's new is that they have now released the code and the models to go along with this. And people have already tried out a bunch of stuff, including putting these into notebooks together with Clip. So thanks to the people involved here and Shepard, Eugenio Herrera and Catherine Krausen. So if you want to try this out, remember StyleGAN 2 is trained on specific data sets. So for example, here I have taken the faces data set, you're able to enter some sort of prompt here for clip. Now I just entered the prompt eagle because I didn't know what was going to happen. So here's the start and let's see what happens. Okay. Yep. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, all right. <laughs> I guess eagle means I'll just slowly disappear. <laughs> But people have come up with quite cool stuff here. Give it a try and see what happens. Here's an interesting paper by Yuval Kirstein, Patrick Lewis, Sebastian Riedel and Omer Levy called a few more examples may be worth billions of parameters. They analyze different NLP tasks and they discover that for some tasks, collecting a few labeled examples will in fact increase the performance of the model in a very drastic way compared to something like a zero shot performance. Now, this is not the case for all models though, which is the interesting part. So for example, if you take something like open question answering, which is where the model has to recall information or go look for information, then increasing the number of examples doesn't necessarily mean that the model gets better. However, just scaling up the model, pre-training it on more data, that is worth a lot. But if you go to something like extractive question answering, where you don't have to recall anything, in fact, you're given the Wikipedia article usually where the answer is contained somewhere, and all you need to to do is find the answer, then a few more labeled examples are actually just as good as scaling the model up to drastic degrees. So the authors hypothesize that in something like open question answering, it's really about how much of pre training you have, which means how much stuff is stored in your weights. Whereas for extractive question answering, it's much more how can you map the question that you're given to specific words in the article. So the model can learn a lot even from very, very simple and few examples. So this might be a thing to consider if you're in an area of NLP and you may not have a lot of data and you ask yourself, should I spend the money to get more training examples? Well, I guess it depends on the task. Another interesting paper is something, something, strike through, patches are all you need, hmm, emoji, under review at iClear 2022. So the first question is, have paper titles gone too far? So this is an absolute meme paper, but the actual contents are really nice. Essentially, the paper does a hybrid architectures between the vision transformers and the MLP mixers. They hypothesize that, at least in part, what makes vision transformers good are the fact that that they operate on patches and not necessarily the transformer architecture by themselves. So they propose an architecture where you put the image into patches, but then it's just a mix between depth wise convolution and point wise convolution, much like the idea of MLP mixer, where you mix the dimensions and then mix the locations repeatedly. With this, they're able to outperform the other two models. And most importantly, this is to the best of their knowledge, the first model that it achieves the elusive goal of having 80% plus image net top one accuracy while also fitting into a tweet. Our field is just memes now. 
And another paper that piqued my interest, vector quantized image modeling with improved VQ GAN. This is an iteration on VQ GAN involving vision transformers, funnily enough, after the last paper. So they go with a two stage approach where in the first stage, they use a transformer encoder and decoder and in between a quantization layer. Now quantization has been really successful in recent months. So it's not surprising that people make strides when introducing quantizations into new places. This then is paired with an autoregressive transformer that takes in the encoded codebook vectors or indices thereof and essentially learns a language model over these. So you're taking a picture, you encode it into latent space. And then in the latent space, you describe it as a sequence of codebook vectors. And that sequence is essentially a language by itself. And on this language, you can train an autoregressive transformer. So now when you want to sample a new image, you can simply go to your transformer, you can let it sample a sequence of these codebook vectors as they would appear in the data set, you can use the transformer decoder to decode it. And there you get a new image. Now the images of this model look really nice. And that is actually my problem. The images almost look too perfect. They look super smooth. They look absolutely crisp. And just these images right here, they seem so clean that they're not even real anymore. Like I would expect these pictures on the front of like a glossy magazine, a Time magazine cover, a National Geographic cover or something like this, not just pictures taken by some person somewhere. Life Science writes, William Shatner AI will chat with you about the Star Trek actor's life. Now this article is essentially about a product called Storyfile. Now Storyfile looks to be quite a cool product. What they do is they will sit you down and film you and ask you various questions about your life that people may ask. Now you just sit there and you just answer these questions. I guess this is going to take quite a long time. But once you have this compiled, it's sort of like an FAQ about your life. And then what they do is they provide you with this text interface or with a speech interface where you can now ask a question. So what makes this different to a regular FAQ is simply that you ask a question and then it finds the closest match in the FAQ list and gives you that answer as pre recorded. And then there's also one time where Shatner says, oh, I can't make any sense of that. And that's what happens when you answer any other question that it can't map. So how much of this is really AI? Not sure, but it's definitely good that they put AI in quotes when they titled the article. Google AI writes about finding complex metal oxides for technology advancement. This blog post is a pretty cool report about research that has been done in finding new materials. Material science is notoriously difficult because essentially we have no clue what happens if we mix two things together that no one has mixed together before. And given the amount of things there are to mix, most things haven't been mixed before. The authors here developed a new method of using an inkjet printer to essentially print mixtures in various dosages into lines on a piece of, I don't know, cardboard, paper, something like this. These are plates and you print out these metal oxide mixtures in lines in various mixtures, components or fractions, then you bake them and then you use optical analysis to try to assess their properties. Now, not all properties are accessible via optical analysis, but you can use machine learning to try to suggest to you interesting compounds that you might want to look further at. So out of the giant amount of possible combinatorical possibilities, to mix, they have come down to just very few that they needed to test further. So this is very much like drug discovery, where also machine learning is now helping to suggest new compounds that might be interesting to look at. So in the end, they found 51 oxide systems with interesting behavior, only one of them had previously been experimentally validated. So all in all, pretty cool. If you're into material science, give this article definitely a read. Next up, TechCrunch writes, Gretel AI raises 50 million US dollars for a platform that lets engineers build and use synthetic data sets to ensure the privacy of their actual data. Gretel AI is a company that focuses on data privacy, on how can we make ML work in sensitive settings? How do we not leak private data and so on? So one of their services is they let you abstract your data such that your ML algorithms can still train, but they will train on synthetic data 
data that is guaranteed to be privacy protected. Now, just conceptually, this is a bit more challenging than it just might seem like any information you pull out of data is potentially related to the privacy of the data where it comes from, even synthetic data, even with various guarantees, as long as information is transmitted, it seems like there might be a risk. But these people are the experts, so I'm not gonna claim anything here. And it looks like their tools are useful in a wide variety of applications. Now, what I love is their website where they have this demo called Accelerate Your Tasks. And here is the timeline that without Gretel, you have to do, oh no, you have an idea, you need to go ask your boss, oh, you need to copy sensitive data, oh no, you have to do all these things at once and then with Gretel wait wait watch a click here wow idea integrate Gretel instantly synthesize or anonymize data innovate in any way, there's a blog post that goes along with the 50 million new funding about why privacy by design matters more than ever. If you're interested, give it a read. And I need to leave. Well, I got kicked up from my other studio. Um, it's not technically my studio. This is gonna be resolved pretty soon. You'll see there's gonna be a new studio. It's gonna be epic. Where were we? Oh yes, DeepMind has released two new works. One is here on BioArchive and one is a blog post by themselves. Though there's a paper to go along with this as well. The first paper is called Protein Complex Prediction with AlphaFold Multimer. And this is a specifically crafted version of AlphaFold to predict the folding of protein complexes. So while the original alpha fold was made to predict how a protein folds from its original chain of amino acids into its final 3D structure, the alpha fold multimer model handles cases where there's not just one chain of amino acids involved. Multiple chains will fold up to create what's called a protein complex. And these are notoriously even harder to predict. And these are notoriously even harder to predict than just single protein. So AlphaFold Multimer contains various improvements that make predicting protein complexes a lot more accurate and improves not only over baselines, but also over the original AlphaFold. The second one is called predicting gene expression with AI. And here we move from the land of proteins to the world of genes. So in your cells, you have DNA and DNA is essentially essentially a long strand of information. And from this information, the amino acid chains that make up the proteins are read off and translated and transcribed. Now it is really important to know which parts of the DNA are read and also how often they are read and translated. Various things on the DNA can influence how different regions are read off. For example, if one part of the DNA is coding for a protein, that region is generally called a gene, then whether or not that gene is actually read off and how much it can be influenced by factors such as how tightly the DNA is wound around uh, proteins called histones. There are also various methyl modifications of the DNA. And lastly, and this might be the most complex thing, there can be what are called promoter and inhibitor sequences that are in front of the gene that influence that gene. And these can be really far away. So imagine a really long text and whatever is happening in here in the text is influenced by like a single word or two words that come way, way, way before. It's like an uber German sentence. So how better to handle this than throw a giant transformer at the problem? And this is what DeepMind did right here. With the giant transformer trained on the DNA, they can predict gene expression better than baselines. And this will improve our understanding and prediction of what various modifications to the DNA will do. So if there is some sort of a variable then gene expressions can be predicted without having to necessarily test it beforehand. Very cool, give it a read. Kunihiko Fukushima has won the Bauer Award for Achievement in Science for work on the neocognitron, possibly the earliest implementation of what would now be called a convolutional neural network. So Fukushima's pioneering work is being prized with an award and some prize money. And none other than Jürgen Schmidhuber has publicly released a YouTube video to honor Kunihiko Fukushima for this work and for the reception of 
the award. Now Schmidt Huber actually has opened a YouTube channel as far as I can tell just for this video or at least that might be the first one. Now is Jurgen going to join the ranks of us ML YouTubers? It would be amazing. I mean this is de facto reaction content so he's already halfway there. Now Schmidt Huber gives a glowing review of the work of Fukushima and what the influences of that work were and he generally seems to be pretty pleased with Kuniku receiving this award. Though about halfway through the speech, he starts to switch from away from work of Fukushima to work of, funnily enough, his own labs. Now I think the story arc he had in mind was to sort of give an overview of what Fukushima had done and then set this in relation to what is happening today. But what is happening today is entirely framed in uh, works of Schmidt Huber's lab. Now of course he's giving this speech so fair enough but with the exception of DanNet which is a convolutional neural network that is coming from his labs and a year before AlexNet won several competitions in computer vision. The rest of the talk is essentially disconnected from Fukushima's work altogether. Talking about LSTMs and how it's one of the most successful papers of all times. Talking about how transformers were invented in the 90s by his labs. More LSTMs and a brief discussion on DanNet. Then going into how highway networks are essentially a precursor to ResNets. And at the end, circling back to Fukushima's work. So it's essentially congratulations, his work was awesome. Also, my work is awesome. Also, congratulations, his work is awesome. Now, if you're interested, the entire speech is available on YouTube. And we, of course, welcome Jurgen to the circle of ML YouTubers. <laughs> Okay, some helpful stuff for this week. Bayer is a benchmark for zero-shot evaluation of information retrieval models. This is available on GitHub and it has various data sets and benchmarks for information retrieval. The Bayesian optimization book by Roman Garnett is out online. It will remain free online, but this version is a sort of a pre-print and I think comments are very welcome. So if you're into Bayesian optimization, optimization or looking to get into it, this is a nice resource. Imaginaire by NVIDIA is a PyTorch library for GANs that now also includes the famous GAN craft. So if you've always wondered what your Minecraft worlds look like if they were real places, this might be the place to go. Mosaic is a new ML startup that came out of stealth mode and presents itself as making ML training efficient. Notably, they came out with two products. One is this experiment explorer, which pays special attention to not only your accuracy and your loss curves, but also the cost and the efficiency at which your experiments run. So for a given baseline, you can find out what is the cheapest way to reach the same accuracy, what is the highest quality that you can achieve while keeping the same speed, what if I want the same cost, and so on. The other product is the Composer, which is supposedly a library to make training uh, neural networks more reproducible. So you can drop in various extra algorithms such as learning rate schedules or squeeze excite layers and so on. Now do we really need another neural network library? And how modular is all of this really? I guess we'll see how this develops. To me, neural network training is seems to be still intricate enough that libraries are most useful when they give you nice primitives that you can plug together instead of ticking a couple of checkboxes like here. I guess it's going to be pretty hard for them to make all of this work together. On the other hand, it's going to be, I guess, kind of easy for something like weights and biases to also include a cost measure of training and be a real competitor to Mosaic here. So I get it, these people make this their primary mission, but I think it's still going to be a hard fought battle over the ML tooling space. I'm excited to see what happens. Tech Explorer writes, Germany unveils its first self-driving train. Now self-driving trains have been used in uh, things like airports and so on, but this is the first self-driving train in Germany that runs alongside other trains on the same tracks. So the report here is actually pretty funny in that it says these self-driving trains are more punctual and energy efficient than traditional trains. They offer a more reliable service. They transport up to 30% more passengers and significantly improve punctual 
spirituality and save more than 30% of energy. Now, what they're actually saying is that German people suck at running trains. I mean, <laughs> Simply replacing human drivers, coordinators, schedulers, and so on with machines makes such a difference. Well, that's on you Germans, that's not on the machines. The New York Post writes, Pentagon's first software chief quit because China has already won global tech war. Pretty strong statement, I have to say. So apparently he told the Financial Times there's good reason to be angry at the US for falling behind. We have no competing fighting chance against China in 15 to 20 years. Right now, it's a done deal. It's already over, in my opinion. He claimed that the US, like Beijing, should have prioritized artificial intelligence, machine learning, and cyber capabilities over traditional military spending like building new fighter jets. Now, this is a stance one can take. Cybersecurity and cyber warfare are important topics. But the article gets a bit weirder. He attacked Google for not working on AI with the US Defense Department, while Chinese companies are obliged to work with Beijing. The US also wasting time debating the ethics of AI, while China makes massive investments and issues such concerns, he said. Well, here is how it works. Uh, US companies and governments and military discuss AI ethics to please one particular loud annoying part of the US public. Mirroring that Chinese companies, government and military also discuss AI ethics to please a very loud part of the US public. I'm not sure how serious we should take these warnings right here. It is of course an interesting question on how much one should balance the very real concerns of AI ethics with the fact that somewhere else in the world someone might care just a little bit less about that and then overpower you in 10-20 years. And lastly, DeepMind becomes profitable. So apparently DeepMind is now profitable for the first time, whilst it has been hemorrhaging money in the past few years. Now the article by uh, Tech Talks here details how this is exactly happening. DeepMind doesn't have any customers by itself. Its only customer essentially is Alphabet. So the parent company is the only customer, which means that DeepMind can essentially set any price they want and the customer is going to pay it. So DeepMind going into the green might be more an accounting trick than anything else. Probably the whole alphabet construct needed to save some taxes and that was the most optimal way to do it. The article goes into more detail on how hard and expensive it is to really do reinforcement learning in the real world and also the strategy DeepMind pursues where they pay a lot of money to acquire the world's top talent. Now that being said, we have recently more and more seen DeepMind venture into solving Solving actual real-world problems. With things like AlphaFold for protein folding prediction and weather now casting, it seems like slowly it might make its way into real markets. Alright, this was it for this week's ML News. Let me know what you think in the comments. I'll see you next time and bye bye.